All right, so I was thinking about song leading and what that is exactly and what the importance of. This was a while back thinking through all this, and then mine started going to uh, just the idea that the job is, as a song leader or any kind of a leader, really, the job is kind of like a cheerleader. And so I wrote down the title of the message, had everything kind of planned out, and and I, I was like, I, I just can't say cheerleader one word because I don't want to be called a cheerleader because in my mind, you think of a cheerleader, <laughs> that's not something I want to be, all right? So I put cheer, new word, leader, all right? Then I started studying the history of cheerleaders, okay? Did you know that cheerleaders originally were men? There were never any women cheerleaders. At the very beginning of the sports, they had the big, you know, megaphone things, and they would just shout. Somebody said, you know, one of their teams, I think it was baseball, might have been football, I'm not sure, but one of the teams was behind, and they started trying to rally, you know, all the crowd and get them excited. So they got out the, the, the megaphone, and they started cheering and, and getting all the crowd to cheer and help their team spring back and have, like, a little rally. And so that was actually the start of cheerleaders. People started actually, guys, groups of guys would get up there and just try to get the, the crowd riled up, get them excited about their team and showing team spirit. And, and, uh, and, and so they would do that. And it actually wasn't until World War II. I'm telling you, World War II, feminism, fem, feminism rose, and ladies started just doing everything, sometimes because they had to, and then sometimes it just kind of led kind of to a down, downward spiral in many ways. And so one of the things they started doing was taking over the cheerleading, which seems kind of interesting to me. But it's interesting to me they even kept doing the sports. But, <laughs> but they did. And during that time, that started happening. Years later, it turned into a show more than actually cheer. You ever think about that? Like, I've thought about that a lot just growing up. We'd play soccer or something like that, and we'd have cheerleaders. And I'm like... I don't really feel like they're getting the crowd to cheer very often. They're mostly just putting on a show, wearing really short skirts so that the guys will be looking at them and stuff like that. And, and it just turned into now there's like all these, it's like a, some acrobatics involved and there's, you know, halftime shows, which are wicked. And, uh, and so cheerleading has ended up being, being kind of a, a bad thing that we think of today. But really, what is cheerleading? Cheerleading is just somebody saying, hey, everybody's dead. We need to lift their spirits up, and we need to say, let's go. We need to charge them up. And I thought about even song leading is like that. Song leading, uh, you know, uh, what you're supposed to do is to get up and get people excited about being there and get them going. And, and sometimes that's hard, I'm telling you, because that makes one thing. We have to make sure that we're excited about it. And then we got to get past our, uh, you know, maybe being self-conscious or whatever, that's something I struggle with, like this feeling like everyone's watching me and I might do something wrong. It took me a while to learn, and they're not really watching you. <laughs> so, uh, so, but song leading to some degree is cheerleading, but then you take it a step farther. Uh, second men, right? Second men are good cheerleaders. You know what I mean? Second men, song leader kind of is a second man, but I'm saying anybody who is like the pastor is called upon to, to do something in a sort of a position of leadership, right? Whether it is, hey, I'm going to put you in charge of the soul winning time, or I'm going to put you in charge of uh, leading singer, or I'm going to put you in charge. Whatever it is he puts you in charge of, that kind of makes you second man. Probably not the best term that there is out there, but you understand what I mean. You've got uh, one guy that's kind of like the head. He's in charge. Uh, a lot of people start saying uh, this is what all these terms that aren't biblical kind of mess people up, but this is like the senior pastor. Then they have like the the music pastor and the youth pastor and all these kind of pastors, and they're not really pastors at all, <laughs> right? So, so it got a little confusing, but the, I, I like the term second man, not because it makes the guy that's at the pastor like some kind of special, untouchable guy. I'm going to talk about that here in a little bit, but because of the fact that it, it, uh, it just, that's what they're doing. And I explained this a while back. I preached a message called The Second Man. I'm, I don't remember who all was here. And one of the things I talked about is how Really, that second person, in some ways, has a greater responsibility uh, if they're going to be a leader. If they're going to, they 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 have the potential of actually being the one that everybody's following, right? And what he what that second person is doing is trying to get everybody to follow the vision of the first 
person. I mean, you, in the, in, no matter what workforce you've ever been in, you probably know that's the case. You know, you're an assistant manager, right? Or actually a manager. 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 But you've got a guy that's ahead of you, and he's going to tell you, hey, this is what we want to do. And your job is not to change that, but to say, hey, guys, here's what we're going to do, right? They don't have to know, well, i got to do it because the boss said that or something. You're just carrying down the orders, and they're following that. And they're following your boss's orders, but they don't really know that. They know they're following you. And I used the analogy before about a standing ovation. You know, if somebody gets up and nobody follows them right, they feel like a real loser and they sit down. <laughs> but if they get up and then somebody else stands up, now there's two people and what they really start kind of a chain reaction, everybody starts following that second person who got up. Next thing you know, people feel like, well, if I don't stand up, then I'm going to be out of place, right? And really that's a good principle. That kind of changed my life. Uh, when I was an assistant pastor, is what they what we call it. I, I would say it's a deacon. Okay, I think biblically, you got pastors and you got deacons, so I would say it's a deacon. But when I was a second man, that changed my perspective on things because I was like, I have a responsibility to carry out the the vision of my leader, but ultimately they're going to be following me, you know, as I follow him. And obviously, he's trying to follow Christ. You see how this, how this goes. Same as in a family. The husband is head of the household, and he's trying to set the family uh, in the direction that he feels like the Lord would have him to go, and everybody else is following that leader. So this is a good example. So wife would be then the second man, <laughs> woman, okay? So if those kids are having a hard time following dad, it could be because... The wife messed up somewhere. Didn't, there was a disconnect. The kids started here, and the mom talked bad about the husband or something like that. But if the wife is following everything the husband says, you know, hey, this is his vision. This is what daddy wants. This is, and then the kids start following their mom. That makes women really the most, a very powerful position that women have, right, as kind of the, the second, second man. So I began to think about all that, and, and really I thought about this even farther, break it down, not just... Uh, somebody that would get up as a leader or be in charge of a certain position or something like that. But I believe that everybody in the congregation can be a cheerleader, all right? And so we're going to talk about three ways. Again, simple message, and since I lost my notes, it's going to be even really, <laughs> it's going to be even more simple. Maybe, we'll see. I think I can remember most of the places we we're going to go. Three ways to be a cheerleader and number one is simply this. Hebrews chapter 10, most people probably have it memorized. Hebrews chapter 10, 24, 25. Hebrews 10, 24, 25. And let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another and so much the more as you see the day approaching. So the first thing that you'd have to do, if you're like, hey, I think you know, God would have me to be a cheerleader and to just get people excited, get people involved in carrying out uh, the pastor's vision and, and what the Lord would have us to do and what they would then do. Okay, we used to take, and I guess this could happen even uh, with this group right here. We could go soul winning, right? And somebody could say, well, I'll make it to soul winning and then never show up to church. And that would be kind of counterproductive. When I was uh, over the, when I was working in the youth ministry, I was trying really hard to get the kids uh, involved in soul winning was my goal. Now at the time, I decided, hey, we would take baby steps and I'll get them out there just inviting people to church. And then later on, we'd teach them how to present the gospel. But anyway, we'll just leave that, we'll just leave that alone. But the, <laughs> yeah. So they started to come out, and they liked the fellowship. They liked the time together. They even liked knocking on doors and talking to people, inviting them to church. They thought it was great, which, by the way, uh, there was two kids that have been coming to our church, Clash in London. Maybe you've been there, and you notice the little blonde head kids at, at the church. Usually they stay in the Sunday morning service, I think. You, you would have seen them. But uh, they come pretty regularly, and they've been going out with us on Tuesdays to be kind of our silent partners and what have you. And they've been taking all these, home these stacks of, of uh, invitations that we have. They have the gospel, gospel tracts, you know. And they've been taking home these stacks of them. And I'm thinking in my head, like, these things are probably going in the trash or they're getting thrown in their junk drawer or something like that. 
And, uh, and Clash came this Sunday and said, I'm out of tracks. You know, can I grab some more? And I'm like, all right, you can grab them. There's in the front. Take them, but don't be wasting them, right? If you're going to take them, you need to give them out. So Tuesday they showed up when we were going to, want to go door knocking, and we started walking down the street, and they're like, oh, we already did this street. And I'm like, well, how far did you go? Oh, we went down to the end, and they pointed like <laughs> several blocks down the road. I was like, okay, we'll go over to this next street. They're like, we already did that street too. I'm not kidding. These kids. <laughs> These kids are going, I was like, okay, well, you just put the tracks on the door then? Because if that's what you did, then we'll go back and knock on the door and say, hey, did you get a track? And they're like, no, we knocked on the door and said, hey, I'm from Iola Baptist Temple. Do you? <laughs> so, I mean, they're not really giving the gospel because they don't know exactly what to do. I do believe they're saved and they could give the gospel. Uh, you know, I've, we had one time had them do a puppet show and said, you can come up with every, whatever you want. You got five minutes to come up with a puppet show. It was around Christmas time, and, and, and we had a little downtime, you know. It was just a, uh, anyway. And so it was like a little Christmas program or something. And we said, we'll give you all opportunities to write this. And we were just, you know, just floored by the, like, doctrine that they were preaching with these puppets, like how to be saved. And one person said, oh, well, I'm really, really, I've, I, I've been really, really good, so I'm going to go to heaven. And the other one said, no, you can't get to heaven by being good. <laughs> I mean, it was just like, I mean, we were in tears, like, watching these kids learning that. And so anyway, so I was just telling you that these kids are, are like ready. They're ready to start teaching how to give the gospel to their friends and, and everything. But anyway, we've got to keep working with them. So when I was working with the teens and a lot of them started enjoying that time of going door knocking. But what I found out is they would go out on Saturday. We would knock doors. They would invite people to church and then they wouldn't show up on Sunday. And I was like, you know, that's kind of like inviting someone to your birthday party and then don't show up. <laughs> Right, you're, you're inviting them to come, you know, and so you you need to be there, and that's true. Like you need to support your church. You can't be like, oh yeah, I just love that church, man. I just really think everybody needs to be coming to this church, and then don't come. That would be ridiculous, right? So some people will say, yeah, yeah, and it says, forsake not the assembling of yourselves together. I love how it says, and so much the more as you see the day approaching, like. Uh, I know the old joke, like, hey, we're closer now to the return of Christ than we've ever been. Well, duh. <laughs> right? Just from the way time works, of course, we're closer. But come on, look at around at the climate of our, of our nation. You know, I wouldn't be surprised if the Antichrist is already on the scene, would you? Like already being, uh, raising up, whatever. I mean, I, I mean Trump's called King Cyrus on the, on the Israeli coin. <laughs> <laughs> so, <clears throat> so, what was I saying? I got confused. Okay, so, uh, uh, what? <laughs> yeah, okay, thank you. So much the door, more as we need the day approach, uh, see the day approaching, so much the more we need to as assemble. And what I hate to see is how many churches are cutting back. You know, well, we won't do evening service. Nobody comes anyway. Wednesday, I mean, you know, not, nobody brings money. You know, so we're not getting any money to pay. We're not even getting enough money on Wednesday nights to pay the bills for the electricity run. I mean, I've heard people say that kind of stuff. And so they'll shut down the evening services. And I'm like, man, so much the more as you see the day approaching. Now, look, somebody could say, well, yeah, but Kansas City, you're only meeting twice a week. That's not true. Now, maybe in Kansas City, maybe we only have two services where we actually meet here. But come on, I'm not trying to, like, shame anybody or whatever, but... Do you not have times to meet together with brothers and sisters in Christ? You've got, obviously, the soul-winning times. Praise the Lord for the good fellowship that everybody has during that time. Uh, you know, there is, I realize we're two hours away, and that's a long drive, but there is services, man. There's something going on. we got Tuesday visitation, Wednesday night service. Uh, we got Thursday uh, services here and visitation here. Uh, Tuesday soul-winning in Iola. We've got, uh, there's something every, almost every day, it seems like. Saturday, soul winning out here. Uh, Sunday, obviously, got four, four different opportunities to get preaching. And then plus soul winning here. There's a lot going on. Now, it's only a matter of how much you want to get into it and meet with other people. And again, I'm not trying to shame anybody. I know two hours long drive, there's a lot to go. And I'm not at all saying that you need to come make every service or anything. But, but look, there's there. And then if you say, well, we just need a little bit more preaching during the week. You know, there's some good churches around here. You could probably just pop in on an off night on a Wednesday or on a, on a Sunday uh, whenever we're not meeting here or, or something. There's opportunities to preach, but we need to assemble, right, as much as 
we can. And we need to get behind the works of our church, and we need to show up, encourage one another. You know, what's going to be more motivating as, you know, talk about this cheerleader, you know, pepping people up and getting them excited, going to be more exciting is if when we're not in church, we're actually calling each other on the phone. When we're not in church, we're actually getting together and encouraging each other. I mean, that's sometimes when people need it the most, right? So they're already pumped up and ready to go before they even step in, into the church, uh, church door. So first thing that you can do to be a cheerleader is simply show up. I mean, that's kind of, that's kind of like a no-brainer, but that's true. The second thing is this. I wonder if anybody already thought about this, but uh, say Amen. When the preacher preaches, right? And I appreciate you guys are good ameners. But look at uh, Nehemiah, if you would. That's something in my life I've had to work at because I'm, I'm not naturally someone that, that amens all the time. I like to kind of contemplate what's being said, think on it a little bit. And that's okay. Not, you certainly don't want to be fake about it. But look at Ezra and Maya. <laughs> Ezra and Maya. <laughs> it used to be called Ezra and Nehemiah. It was one book. <laughs> Ezra Nehemiah, chapter 8. All right. I'm going to find it. Okay, so what a great story. Uh, they, this is after the captivity. They go back into the land. You know, they've been there for, with Z Zerubbabel, and then they've been there for a little while, and then... Uh, uh, now Nehemiah is going back into the land, rebuild the wall and all that. And so they, they come together and look at verse, uh, let me see here. Uh, I think I wrote it down actually because I thought this might happen. For some reason, whenever I get to this point, uh, everything on my page turns white and I can't find it. So uh, I know it's here in chapter 8. So, okay, here's the deal. All the congregation, look at verse 2 even. Ezra the priest brought the law before the congregation both men and women and all that could hear with understanding. Okay, they're all there. Verse 3, he's reading before them the Word of God, and, and, uh, and he's even standing on a pulpit of wood and, and all this. It looks a lot like a modern-day service to me. Uh, verse 6, he blesses the Lord, the great God, and all the people answered, Amen, Amen, with lifting up their hands, and they bowed their heads and worshiped the Lord with their faces to the ground. You see that the whole congregation was in unison, right? They were paying attention. And tell me, I mean, this guy was getting up there reading the entire book of the law. Right? And everybody was, and I think about that a lot of times. We're, we're like really spoiled. Like we, we, we crave like good preaching. And if someone's not a great preacher, it puts us to sleep or whatever. But like, man, I just didn't get a lot out of that. And I think like, well, yeah, what about Paul the Apostle? Like I, I think he was a good and effective preacher, but probably not as dynamic as you think he was. And you think about him getting there and he's giving a report and he's going back and rehearsing all these things and he's going through the Bible and expounding it. And he's got this whole group of people in the upper room and, they're, and, it's, and he's, been pre he's preaching until midnight and it's hot in there and the guy Eutychus goes and sits by the wall to get a little fresh air. I'm kind of reading into the story. And he's preaching till midnight. I mean, that's a long time he's been preaching. And Eutychus falls asleep, falls out, the, <laughs> falls out the window, right? And he has to revive him and all that. So anyway, what a great story. But what I'm saying is a lot of times the preaching wasn't even super, like, exciting necessarily, right? So don't wait. Like, hey, I'll, if the guy gets up there and he's really putting on a show and he's sweating and he's spitting and all that, then I'll say amen. Look, there's a lot of good things that are said, even with not necessarily the most forceful way of saying it. Does that make sense? So if it's in the Bible and it's true, and you can relate to what it's being saying, and you're like, hey, man, that's right. It helps everybody, not just the preacher, right? It helps everybody when you say amen. I remember this. I remember times as a kid sitting around and, and, and doing one of these numbers. You know, you've all done that in church, right? I used to do it all the time. In the choir, by the way, at Southwest. <laughs> Afterwards, everybody like, I saw you up there. So uh, anyway, everybody, <laughs> everybody starting to fall asleep. And then all of a sudden, there'd be like this little breakout. Somebody's saying, amen. It kind of wakes you up. And you start thinking, well, I need to pay attention to what's going on. And then if you're looking for the opportunity to say amen, that kind of keeps you on your toes too. So it's kind of like cheerleading. The preacher cheerleading, getting the crowd excited about what's being said. Hey, we're gonna, you know, I'm going to show everybody we're in tune. We're in agreement with what the preacher's saying. And notice this. Now, the Bible says, look at 2 Timothy. We know this. I don't have to spend a lot of time on this. We're all like-minded in this way, but... 
The Bible has a lot to say about women being silent in the church, learning in sub subjection. Uh, if they, you know, at home they can learn from their husband. We got a uh, in Iola. You know, not everybody that's there has husbands. Some of them are widows or whatever, and they've been there for a long time. And it's a little difficult because sometimes they want to do all the expressing and the giving opinions and all that. And to some degree, it's like, oh, man, I got to deal with this. So, But if somebody is married, they should live a life that demonstrates that they're in submission. And so they are actually not uh, doing a whole lot of talk, no, not, no teaching or instructing or usur usurping authority. Look at what is it? Uh, 1 Timothy 2. 1 Timothy 2. I don't think that's the one I'm looking for, but it, it'll work. I think there's another one in Corinthians. But it says this in verse 12, But I suffer not a woman to teach nor to usurp authority uh, over the man, but to be in silence. Okay, and I've heard people take that to the extent where they say, hey, women shouldn't even say amen in the church. I don't particularly agree with that. I think women can say amen. They're saying I'm in agreement with what the pastor's saying now. If they use that amen to like usurp authority, <laughs> Right? Like if the preacher is saying something against the husband. Uh, now, husbands, you need to make sure that you love your wife. And they're like, amen. Right. That might not be appropriate. <laughs> OK. But if they say amen in agreement with what he's saying, I don't have a problem with that. I think the whole congregation can do that. That was certainly the case with Nehemiah, which I realize is Old Testament. But uh, so the Bible does talk about women being silent. But look at Exodus 15. We just recently talked about music, and I mentioned this verse here. There was a great role that Miriam played. In chapter 15, there's a song of Moses. He's then saying, Moses, uh, the children of Israel, this and the children of Israel, this song unto the Lord. And you skip down to verse 20. After he finishes this song, Miriam the prophetess, the sister of Aaron, took a timbrel in her hand, and all the women went out after her with timbrels and with dances, and Miriam answered them, Sing ye to the Lord, for he hath triumphed gloriously. The horse and his rider hath he shown into the sea. I think women can have a, a great, uh, they have a great job of being able to kind of back up, you know, the men, back up their husbands, back up. And, you, you know, you don't want to take that too far. I understand as far as uh, making themselves real loud and, and boisterous and all that kind of stuff. But they can definitely get behind and they can be a cheerleader of sorts, okay? So first of all, simply showing up and just being there to support the church, being there to support what's being done, saying amen, backing up what's being said. If, you agree, if you're in agreement with it, obviously, then back up what's being said with a hearty amen as often as you can. Uh, and what a way to help a service actually be alive and people not falling asleep and people not uh, just kind of like everything's going over their head. They're thinking about what they got to do, you know, that afternoon, what's for dinner. They're thinking about all the things that happened to them at work or in the, in the past week. No, we need to focus in on what's being said out of the Bible. Read along and, and uh, say amen where it's appropriate. The third thing is this. I could, I could, we could say a whole lot more, but the third thing is this. Speak well about your church and the vision of your pastor. Very important. Speak well about the church, what's going on. Hey, well, I want to really support that. And I know you guys are like that. I mean, you're proudly wearing the shirt, KC Mission, <laughs> right? That's, that's great, right? You're, you're supporting. You're supportive. That helps not only uh, the people that might see and might be considering, you know, hey, should we go check out that church? But also the people that are in the service say, hey, yeah, something to be part of, something to be, be proud of, you know. You're supporting uh, that work. Now, in the Bible, uh, there is this verse here in 1 Timothy chapter 5. 1 Timothy chapter 5. And I'm going somewhere with this, but let's start with just this, okay? It says, uh, there's another one I'm looking for, though. It says, rebuke not an elder, but entreat him as a father, 
and the younger men as brethren. So we read this, a rebuke not an elder. Now, again, I'm getting somewhere here, so be patient with me. But there's another one. I think it's, uh, maybe it's in Peter. First Peter. Maybe somebody can help me where it says, uh, uh, receive not a, uh, an accusation. Anybody know where that is? I think it's First Peter. Yeah. I mean, I could, we, we could explain that, but uh, is that Paul that said it? I thought that I wrote that one down, but see what happens when you lose your notes? If anyone could find that, my, I could look it up on my phone, but my, my uh, battery's dead. I think it's important that we look at it. I don't want to just explain it. Um, that's not actually what it says. Receive not an accusation, but with two or three witnesses. So let me just tell you while somebody's looking for that. So my whole life, and I'm not accusing every pastor I've ever had of, of having bad motives or something like that, but my whole life I was raised, as you see, 1 Timothy 5. It was 1 Timothy, but what did I do wrong here? So we were right there. 1 Timothy 5.19, thank you. And so I'll read it, and then I'll get back to what I was saying. Okay, so it's the same chapter. Rebuke not an elder, but entreat him as a father. And then verse 19 says, Against an elder receive not an accusation, but before two or three witnesses. And what I want to say is that a lot of guys have left out that last part of it. Okay, I'm setting something up here. A lot of people have left out that last part, and they say, Hey, receive not an accusation against an elder. And so growing up, I'll, I'll tell you, if you don't think it's true for me, you can look around at some things that have happened of late in the independent Baptist circles where people think like the preacher, the pastor, he's untouchable. Man, don't you accuse him. Don't you go against your pastor. That's like going against God, you know, and he's untouchable and you don't receive an accusation against him, whatever. That's not what it says. It says, receive not an accusation against an elder. It says, but before two or three witnesses, All right? So there is a time where uh, a, pre a pastor has done something wrong Right. And there needs to be correction. Someone needs to go against him. And don't you ever think like, oh, well, he's the pastor and I'm I love my church and I want to be a cheerleader like he's talking about. And so I don't ever want I want to just hide his faults and stuff under underneath the rug. You won't find that anywhere in the Bible. And we're in a in a really pivotal, pivotal time in the independent fundamental Baptist circles because it's coming to light that so many people have just hid this stuff under the rug. And uh, there's been abuse. There's been uh, uh, all kinds of, of things done <coughs> because people have used their power and used their authority to just hold it over people. Like, hey, you can't do anything against it. You can't say anything against me. I'm the pastor, you know, and, and, and that would be absolutely wrong. OK, but here is what I want to say. So the third thing that I have down for being a cheerleader is talk good about your church. I'm not telling, I'm not saying lie. <laughs> I'm saying say the positive things that you can say about your church and your pastor, okay, and your pastor, uh, his, the vision that he has for the church, all right? Try to be as positive and, 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 and helpful as that. But the reason I wanted to share all that is because this, there is a way to go to your pastor whenever he's do, when you disagree with him or you notice that he's done something wrong or you wish that he would do something differently. Don't just let that go. In fact, I'm telling you as a pastor, I need to hear it. Like, I want to know, like, like, man, I think that we would do better if we did this, right? And just bring it before the pastor and have that kind of conversation. But the idea is this. Don't just go around talking behind the pastor's back. I'm not saying that anyone's doing this. You understand. I'm just saying that I'm just precaution. Don't go talking behind the pastor's back and saying, ah, he does this, and I wish he would do that, and why doesn't he do that? Uh, uh, that would be wrong, okay? And don't just believe something just because it was said by one person or whatever. Uh, but what you want to do is you want to help your pastor. And so not just talking good about him and in your heart and in your mind thinking, yeah, well, I got to say all these nice things about him, but really he's this and he's that. And I wish he was better at this. No, go. there's a time to go to him. All right. So one day, Lord willing, I'll be able to preach this message again. But a long time ago, and this is when I was, uh, this is before I became a pastor. I preached this message 
And I, I did this study. I just this, this, this kind of popped out to me in the Bible. And we won't take time to go to, this, to those references right now. Like I said, hopefully one day I'll be able to preach it again. Uh, I noticed that when Korah raised a rebellion against Moses, right, what did he say? He said, you take too much upon you, right? And he pops up, and Moses is just, like, taken off guard. Like, well, he's got this mob of people out there that have already been talking about him, already been building up the case. Nobody ever came to him and talked to him. They just had this, we're ready to just take care of business right here. And they just show up on Moses' front door and say, hey, you take too much upon you. And then he started bringing this accusation against him, right? And, uh, of course, I think uh, in that situation, Moses showed he was very humble about it and even fell on his face and prayed to the Lord. And the Lord wasn't so gracious, <laughs> actually, was he, to Korah, all right? But I noticed this while I was reading about Jethro. Jethro, Moses' father-in-law, and, and, and he's his father-in-law. He might have felt like, I got authority to tell Moses what to do, but he didn't do that. He went to him and said almost the exact same thing. He said, Moses, you take too much upon you, right? Because what was he doing? He was running himself ragged. Uh, he was having all the like million people, two million people, whatever it is, come to him, and he's standing in this line just taking them one by one, and he's handing all the cases. And Jethro said, you're wearing them out. You're wearing yourself out. But he didn't go around saying that to everybody else. You see what I'm saying? He went to Moses and said, Moses, here's an idea. <laughs> what you're doing is not good. You're going to wear yourself out. Here's an idea I want to run by you. And then he even said this. Maybe the Lord would allow you, right, to, to do that. He was t saying, take people uh, that you can teach, and they can, they can do the judgments. They'll bring the, the b major issues to you, right, but all these guys. It was great advice, great advice. We see the apostles did the same thing in Acts 6. You know, they, they said, hey, we, we can't leave the Word of God and serve tables, so appoint you, you know, these men, and, and we'll choose among those which guys can, uh, can be basically that start of the deacons, right? So anyway, but he went to him, and he said, Moses, you know, I, I, this is in private. He's in private. And he says, Moses, I worry, you know, that this is, this is going to be bad for you and it's going to be bad for them. And so here's my suggestion. And then he said, maybe the Lord would allow you to. Okay, the implication I think there is this. If you don't do it my way because God tells you to do it another way, I'll shut up and I'll back up, right? But I'm thinking that this is a good advice and I'm going to give you that advice and you can go before the Lord and figure that out. Does that make sense? I think that is the way to approach your pastor with that heart that says, I don't want to destroy your ministry because I don't like what you're doing, right? But I want to privately tell you that I think this would be a good idea. I think this would, this would help you. It would help other people or whatever. And then, he's, and then he just left it between him and the Lord, right, and backed up. And so talk nice about your pastor. Say good things about your pastor and the church and the work that's being done. But don't for one minute think that you... Oh, well, I'm not the pastor. Like God didn't call me into this position, so i got to shut up and I can't share my opinions. No, your pastor probably wants to hear your opinions. He probably wants to hear your advice and your counsel and just do it in the right spirit, in the right manner, and then ultimately leave it up to the Lord's hands. So cheerleader, sorry to say that because it seems so weird to be a <laughs> cheerleader. The mascul most masculine cheerleaders you can be, man. <laughs> be a cheerleader, show up. Show up to everything you can show up to. And I'm not saying that we're looking for you, and if you don't show up because you had some family thing or something happened, we understand those things happen. Nobody's, I don't think, judging you and saying, why wasn't that person there? I mean, uh, Brother Nick couldn't make it tonight. Who thought, Brother Nick, oh, he must be backsliding. Didn't, I think everybody knows Nick's heart, and uh, he wasn't able to make it tonight, so no one's feeling like that. But, but you in your own mind, in your own heart, say, man, can I make this activity that the church is, is, is doing? And, and, then, uh, and then obviously... Show up, say amen, that was the other thing, and then talk well about your church and talk well about your pastor's vision. Get behind it as much as you can, but don't be afraid to encourage and share suggestions. I, could, I know I could use it. I'm, I'm human and very fallible, like I need to tell you that, but <laughs> let's go to Lord in prayer. 